Well, good afternoon. This is Jim Cruzan with another Capital Market Review. This will be for the first quarter. And as always, the information that is expressed here is uh, information uh, directly from me, Jim Cruzan, and not that of uh, Raymond James nor Raymond James Financial Services. Uh, this is kind of interesting. I'm uh, doing this call from uh, my home remotely, as we are all, all uh, 15 team members are all working remotely these days. Uh, it's incredible uh, what technology can do. Uh, as I do every quarter, I come up with a theme. What a difference uh, several uh, weeks has made. Uh, the theme this uh, quarter is uh, 2020, uh, the year of the virus, as I believe we will be dealing with this in some way, shape, or form, uh, certainly for the balance of this year. We do these uh, because we do think uh, the economy matters or what happens with the economy certainly has a direct influence over portfolios, expected returns, etc. And as is typically the case, uh, we will try to dissect some key components to the economy, such as growth, or lack thereof, jobs, corporate profits, inflation, and interest rates. We do this in an attempt to ascertain kind of where we are right now, but more importantly, where we're heading. And as I said, what a difference. Just two months ago, actually less than two months ago, Markets were at an all-time high. We were talking about a Teflon economy. Uh, we were talking about how uh, there is nothing that would disrupt the economy and uh, expected economic growth. We had just passed the trade deal with China. We had just passed the uh, North American trade deal as well. And the thought was GDP could actually grow. It was just a little over a month or so ago, I was at a conference. And we were talking about the coronavirus, and we were talking about China, but the talk was surrounding supply chain and what would happen to supplies and shipments. Certainly, no one thought we would see a halt in economic activity, as we've seen presently. The economy matters, as I said before. And just two months ago, we were talking about a maturing economy slipping from slow economic growth to maybe an economic slowdown, which by the way can be very good for the market. Now we're talking about will we wind up in a recession or not? Will we have a recession or negative GDP for the first quarter? And certainly negative GDP for the second. Two negative quarters in a row becomes a recession. Our agenda? We're going to start with a, a couple of comments about COVID. Uh, we will then talk about the economic uh, outlook. The government's response, which has been huge. We will talk about market reactions. And then we'll also talk a little bit about the anatomy of a recovery and what that might look like. So let's begin. This data, as we see here, is right through the end of the first week in April. And the data or the blue bars in the first box uh, represent the COVID issue as it relates to outside of China. Uh, we have had outside of China a million seven confirmed cases. We've had 360,000 uh, recoveries. And sadly, 111,000 souls were lost. Those numbers uh, continue to grow. However, they're growing at a slower rate. The second chart talks about the weekly change in cases. And the number of cases being confirmed weekly are dropping and dropping precipitously. The mortality rate globally continues to climb, and it will. If you look at the, the dark line as it moves left to right in an ascending direction, and you'll see the mortality rate right now is about 6%, a little over 6. The expectation is when all is said and done, and the models project out the actual number of folks who have COVID, the mortality rate 
should be hovering a bit closer to 1%. It isn't because of the number of confirmed cases being such a small percentage of actual live cases. And that's just a function of the mechanics of being able to test and test that many people. When we talk about projections as to what impact we'll see in corporate earnings or the economy, a lot of this has to do with these stay in place orders and social distancing. The first chart here, consumer spending by industry, specifically focusing on those industries that will have a major impact or will be major impacted as a result of stay in place. We take well, outside of food and beverage, restaurants, bars, entertainment. <clears throat> those areas alone represent about 19% of our GDP. So when you look at analyst projections as to how bad things could get, the ranges of a 10% to as much as a 30 or 35% contraction in GDP have a lot to do with a bit more than half of that is just from the entertainment, food, and beverage um, aspect of our economy. The chart below, it talks about employment. And you'll see in terms of those particular industries that there's about 20% of payroll jobs could be impacted. So that translates directly into projections of a 20% unemployment rate or greater. And then if you talk to analysts about what impact this will have on corporate earnings, the number bandied about is about a 7 to 10% reduction in corporate earnings. Again, looking at retail, ex food and beverage, restaurants, entertainment, airlines and cruises, hotel and tourism, that's about 7% of total S&P operating earnings. So the numbers that we see here are greatly impacted by those unique industries that have a lot to do with how we spend our money on entertainment. Let's talk a little bit about the economy as a whole. This chart talks about PMI, uh, that's the Purchase Managers Index, that has to do with manufacturing in particular. And you'll see at the end of that first chart, uh, it cratered. Uh, we went from over 50% PMI, which means expansion, to 37%, anything less than 50 is a reduction or a contraction in activity, a sharp drop, a drop that's almost equivalent to the drop we saw during the financial crisis, again, for an entirely different reason. The financial crisis was all about liquidity and the lack of transparency. We have a fairly healthy economy going into this. This has everything to do with staying in place. While manufacturing took a hit, so did the service industry. This is a heat chart. Uh, it identifies uh, economic activity, in this case it's services globally, and uh, it is uh, on a range from green to red. Red implies contraction or lack of activity, and the darker the uh, colors become moving to green indicate the robustness of economic activity. Now if we look at this chart and if we kind of look at these numbers right here, this is the end of 2019, I don't know if you can see my cursor, I'm kind of hovering over this. To a large degree they were green, although uh, they were a little, little bit of a, a pale green compared to where they were several years before when the economy was growing at a much faster pace. This is also one of the reasons that we thought, look, we may be moving into an economic slowdown from a slow growth environment. But what's really interesting is we went from that environment at the end of 2019 to where we are here in March. That's this very last column to the right, all red, with the exception of India. And it is also under 50. So we went from being relatively healthy to an absence in activity as it relates to services. And this has a lot to do with social distancing. And the thought is these numbers will improve 
and improve fairly quickly when we are uh, when the order to stay in place is is lifted. Uh, the argument today is is it a V-shaped recovery, a more moderate U-shaped recovery, or is it more of an L shape where we bounce along the bottom here for a while? A couple other things have happened as a result of this issue. Um, we're beginning to see in this first chart, the one on the left, uh, again, a resurgence in a U.S. dollar activity uh, as a uh, safe place for storage of value. Uh, money comes pouring into U.S. dollars. People buy treasuries for safety. At the same time, we cut our interest rate significantly. We'll have a, a few charts on that. So when you look at the rate differential as it stood toward the end of 2019 and where it is today, we've eliminated a lot of that differential. Uh, as of last year, there was almost a 2% spread between a 10-year Treasury bond, which you could get as an interest rate, and what you would get in Europe for a comparable bond. Again, Europe had, in some cases, negative interest rates. And dollars were flowing in to the U.S. to capture the higher interest and the dollar strengthen. Now, this should help weaken the dollar, which will help encourage economic activity here if it wasn't for this flight to safety that we're seeing here. So the fact that there's less of a differential in interest rates is actually a positive and, and could help uh, make our goods and services a bit more attractive. I remember having a conversation with clients back in 2015-16 as it related to um, pensions, taking pension versus lump sum. And back then, again, I don't know if you can see my cursor, uh, interest rates were, uh, at that point, nearly all-time lows. Well, because of the activity that we've seen as a result of COVID, rates today are actually lower still. Uh, as of the end of the, uh, actually, <clears throat> as of the end of uh, March, um, we had uh, interest rates uh, for a 10-year treasury that were sub 1%. In fact, they were 073 as of April 9th. The real rate, when you factor in inflation's effect on that, is now quite negative. So money in the bank, while it may look safe, uh, is losing money every year on a real basis, inflation adjusted, to say nothing of an after-tax real base when you factor in the tax uh, you'll have to pay on whatever interest is earned. Uh, as of uh, today, uh, the price of oil is tanking. Uh, oil futures are actually negative today, uh, which means theoretically that a barrel of oil is worth less than zero. Uh, it's an anomaly. Uh, we're in a trade war uh, between uh, Russia and the Saudis that are affecting worldwide consumption. Um, for consumers, it's great. Uh, we will find lower prices, which will lead to more money in our pocket, which will give consumers the ability to spend, and that should help the economy as it relates to the consumer supply. Sadly, it's going to hurt many oil and gas industries, uh, not only uh, distributors and oil retailers, but E&O uh, exploration and uh, uh, output uh, will also be hurt as well. And part of the reason for that is we are now a net uh, producer of oil. Uh, if you look at this chart here, um, we produce 20.9 uh, million barrels a day, uh, and we consume 20.5. So for somebody who sells oil elsewhere, these low oil prices are hurting our industries. Conversely, China is a net consumer. Uh, they're not on the short list of producers. They do not produce. So all countries that import oil should see a, uh, a positive swing to their economies at some point in time.
Let's talk about the federal response. It is huge. Among other things, they have spent 2.3, almost 2.3 trillion dollars, which is about 11% of GDP, um, on the third phase of the stimulus. Uh, we're about to get phase four, uh, which will add additional funding to the uh, PPP program, which is a payroll protection program. Uh, this money is diverse. It's going into a number of different areas. When you look at the uh, response that the government has put forward and the expected contraction in GDP, the response is huge. Between fiscal stimulus, uh, the government providing dollars and monetary stimulus, the Federal Reserve buying up bonds and such, it's almost $8 trillion of support. When you look at the contraction that we expect to see, about 6% in the first quarter, 30% in the second quarter, when you consider each quarter is worth about $5 trillion of GDP, you're looking at uh, something under $2 trillion of contraction, and we've thrown about $8 trillion plus of support. Um, it's needed, but it has its own long-term repercussions. When you look at the uh, federal budget in terms of surplus or deficit, uh, for this year, we're expecting our uh, our deficit to run 13.6% of our GDP. That is a big, big number. Just a year ago, it was about 5%. Now, over time, as our GDP continues to grow, that number will diminish. But when you look at debt, which is the aggregate amount of deficits every year, uh, that number, which as of last year was just over 79% of GDP, is expected to grow and grow pretty significantly to nearly 100% of GDP or 111% of GDP, depending on whether you look at the CBO's uh, forecast or uh, JP Morgan's forecast. Um, when you start having total debt exceed GDP, a significant amount of one's natural resources and output is now redirected toward debt service. And that's monies that is not being put toward R&D, um, creating capital, starting businesses, developing patents, etc. So it has an impact. China's debt to GDP is about 130%. Uh, just as a point of reference. So while the government is spending uh, an awful lot of money and putting it out into the economy, our central bank, the Federal Reserve, is also buying back a whole lot of uh, mortgages and backstopping everything. Uh, they are buying mortgages. They are buying government bonds. They are buying high-yield debt. They are buying... Uh, auto loans that are being packaged and collateralized as bonds to backstop these industries. And we're not alone. Every single one of the major central banks has done the same thing. Bank of England, Bank of Japan, ECB. And at the same time, this year, just about all the central banks on a net basis have been cutting their interest rates as opposed to hiking interest rates. So that uh, equates to a tremendous amount of stimulus. <clears throat> to give you an idea of what that means in terms of bonds here, when you look at long-term U.S. bonds uh, and, and measure it as a bond aggregate, that's an index, which is a sum total of many different types of bonds, that aggregate was yielding about 2.3% as of the end of the year. It's now yielding under one and a half. So we've had some fairly significant price appreciation on bonds. I don't see how bonds will provide much appreciation off of these levels. They would have to go appreciably lower still. So bonds, as it relates to a portfolio, really is still useful um, as a portfolio insurance policy 
um, as it provides some protection against dropping equity prices. But at the same time, you're not going to see a whole lot of price appreciation off of bonds. And the yields, being as low as they are, um, aren't all that advantageous to hold for long periods of time either. When you look at <laughs> debt service uh, and you look at the total amount of debt to GDP, again, we're hovering at a very, very close level when you look at all, some total of all government bonds. The good news is households are in much better stead. They've been reducing their degree of household debt significantly since the financial crisis, and that trend continues to go lower. So the average American is in better stead to weather this uh, issue. Um, obviously, there's some disruption in, in paychecks, which, which had a dramatic effect. But when we look at debt service, and with interest rates uh, dropping even further, there's a huge resurgence in home refis that will make things that much uh, easier to maintain as we come out of this. Because interest rates are as low as they are, you just are not getting paid a whole lot to uh, have money sitting in bonds. We certainly have a large bond contingent in the portfolio. As we're not quite sure where this market is going to go, and we need to hedge our bet. But when you look at um, yields that are available in super safe bonds, U.S. Treasuries, they're getting hardly any yield at all. To get any kind of yield, you really got to go out into emerging market debt, high yield bonds. And as you move further out in this direction, you also are uh, tightening the correlation between bonds and stocks. So as you move out, the money in bonds to protect against a stock market drop just doesn't provide a whole lot of support or help. Uh, and if you are looking for the bonds to serve as portfolio protection, you're really just not getting paid a whole lot to do that. So it's a little bit of a quandary. When the, uh, when, when people started staying home, and there was a uh, concern back at the end of March uh, as to what impact this might have on the economy, and that still hasn't been sorted out, there was a huge surge in, in credit spreads, implying a big surge in default rates. And that has simply not been the case. If you look at the 30-year uh, average uh, of spread to worse, you'll see how it uh, increased significantly here uh, just a, a few weeks ago. But when you look at the default rate, the default rate is actually about the same, actually a bit less. So as a result, this huge spread in, in bonds, in, in bond yields, and uh, spread to worse, are starting to uh, narrow and are coming back in. So bonds, when all this hit, bond stocks, they all didn't perform as well as they could have. Everything was somewhat correlated. Now you're beginning to see bonds kind of step back up, uh, still not providing a whole lot of uh, growth, but at least performing more in line with what one would expect. When you look at this uh, recovery that we've seen in the last 10 years or so, uh, as it relates to um, the uh, financial crisis, uh, you will see that this drop that we've experienced here uh, through April, about 19%. Right now, I think the markets are off about 8 or 9% as we speak today. Is certainly the largest drop that we've seen since the financial crisis. Um, a bit larger in 2010 of 16%. Um, we dropped as much as 34% before recovering. Here, we bottomed out at about 19 So uh, we've seen some ugliness before and the bull market continued to recover. Uh, we'll have to see whether that was the end of the bull market and we're now in a bear market. I somewhat doubt that because of how this was uh, uh, created, how we came to this point. But certainly in the last 10 years, we've had other periods of size of the drop and recovered pretty significantly from those as well. When you look at it over a broader base, the drop that we saw here in the last month or so 
off its current valuation is hardly noticeable, much less than the 50% drop off of its base 10 or so years ago, or the tech wreck that we saw uh, 10 years prior to that. So on a, uh, a log scale, it's, it's much less noticeable and less impactful. Because of the drop, we've seen some improvement in valuations. Um, uh, PEs are still somewhat high. Uh, they're still higher uh, than where uh, than the 25-year uh, history. Uh, they're a bit less uh, expensive than they were, uh, say, two months ago. Uh, the Schiller PE, the uh, Cape uh, rating, has improved a little bit. Dividend yield has improved a little bit. Price to book has dropped, which makes uh, it a bit more attractive. And the uh, the uh, earnings yield minus the BAA yield, which is uh, the in invert of corporate earnings to bonds, uh, is actually a, a, a bit more attractive now than it was before. So from a valuation point of view, the market on the fringes is certainly more attractive than it was two, um, two months ago. I like this chart uh, just because it gives us an idea of history. Uh, the gray bars show the performance of the S&P 500 on a calendar year basis. <clears throat> the red dot the boot, indicate the largest drop that year from a high during the year. So um, we suffered a 34% drop uh, as of the date of this chart. Uh, market is down year to date 14%. Um, the average drop on a yearly basis is about 13.8%. Over the last 40 years on average, the market drops 13.8% yearly. And there's absolutely no correlation between a drop of 13 or 14% and a positive or negative outcome. So we'll see whether this is another year where we finish as a positive return in spite of the big drop in drawdown. It certainly is not outside of the realm of what would be expected. This is not an unusual drop by any means. And right now, what looks the most attractive? Uh, presently, uh, it would appear to, to me that uh, because we're looking at such low GDP growth, that value stocks tend to outperform growth. And they tend to outperform by a, a goodly amount, about one to one and a half percent per annum. Um, this uh, also uh, coincides fairly well to this chart, which would suggest that value stocks tend to be cheap uh, at, at this point in time. This is a, a Z score. So we, we think uh, dividend oriented companies are holding their value better. And when the economy rebounds, uh, they will also rebound fairly significantly as well. All right, so that leads us to the, uh, the last point I wanted to uh, uh, briefly discuss, and that's the anatomy of the recovery. I don't have really great slides on this, so I'll go back to the S&P 500 slide, just to give you an idea. There are several different ways that uh, we will come out of this. Uh, we can come out of this as a V-shaped recovery, uh, where the market goes down, hits its bottom, and then immediately bounces up uh, significantly without too much of a setback. Or uh, it could be more of a, a W, where we go down, we get a sizable lift, then another uh, drop, followed by maybe several more. Um, if you have many of those, it becomes more of an L shape, meaning you have the big drop, and then we just kind of bounce along the bottom for quite some time before we come out of this. Uh, consensus would suggest that we'll have somewhat of a, a U shape as opposed to a V, which would imply that where we are today, the huge drop that we saw, coupled by the recovery that has taken us about 50% off the bottom, uh, the odds are we don't go straight up from here. We may very well retest these uh, lows or retest a good portion of what we recovered before we really see the uh, recovery uh, in earnest. And, and that would make some sense. 
we're getting some clarity at this point uh, as it relates to uh, the coronavirus, COVID-19. Uh, and uh, we still don't have a lot of clarity around the economy, what impact we have, what uh, secondary and tertiary issues we haven't even considered that might be impacted as well, or just how much additional money uh, will the uh, government uh, feel compelled to throw at this problem. And I think there will be more negative news throughout the quarter as it relates to the economy and corporate earnings and uh, high-profile bankruptcies and the impact on lower oil prices as it relates to uh, companies that serve those industries. And I think uh, there will be an opportunity to retest, which is fine. Uh, many of our portfolios uh, at this point are structured uh, fairly conservatively. You know, we are 50 percent-ish in, in equity with a lot of dry powder. And the idea is if we do get the retest, we kind of have our buys as well as some additional sells already built out in place. So we should be able to navigate this thing fairly, um, fairly well um, as we sit back and have a better understanding of what the data looks like. So that concludes the capital market review for the first quarter of the year as uh, we sit today. Uh, sometime here in April. I just wanted to remind everybody uh, that if you have friends or family uh, that are a bit confused about what's going on, uh, would like to uh, talk to somebody about uh, their plans for retirement or how they're dealing with retirement or their portfolios, we'd love to help. Uh, you can visit uh, our site at Caden Wealth Management uh, or just www.cadenwealth.com and click the Get Started button, and there's plenty of information there to uh, have a friend, family, uh, relative uh, book a, uh, an appointment uh, with one of my team members and uh, conduct a, uh, a second opinion. Uh, we uh, use a very elegant uh, process. We call it our evolutionary wealth process, uh, starting with a discovery interview, clarifying goals and objectives, providing some degree of guidance, and an array of solutions. And then, if it makes sense, uh, a formal engagement, they become a client, and we begin servicing their portfolios and their needs as well. So if you have any questions, feel free to reach out, 810-593-1624, uh, or again, reach out to us at www.kittenwealth.com. And as always, I wanna thank you uh, for your time and consideration, and certainly the trust and confidence you place in myself and my team. I uh, can't uh, express how important that is to each and every one of us. And I also want to uh, have you spend a few seconds on the back end uh, looking at all the important uh, legal notifications as well as index definitions. All right. With that, thank you. If you uh, need anything or we can be of any service, please reach out. Otherwise, we plan on talking to you again next quarter. Take care. Be safe.